<clears throat> well, welcome to Ivy Green. The home was given that name 201 years ago. David and Mary Keller came here from Virginia and they purchased 640 acres. We have 10 acres left of that original 640. This was a self-sufficient plantation. Everything was made, raised, or grown right here on the property. 85% of what you'll see today is original because it stayed in the family. We have furniture, we have clothing, we have knitting, we have things that belong to Helen still here. Ivy was growing everywhere, English ivy, not poison ivy. <laughs> and so that's why they named their home Ivy Green. The nails in the floor were handmade and put in the heart pine flooring in 1820. Helen's father grew up in this house. His name was Arthur Keller. He had been a captain in the Confederate Army. That was his title. Here in town, he was an attorney. He was editor of the local newspaper. He was a farmer. His first wife was named Sarah. They had two boys, James and Simpson. She got sick and died after 10 years of marriage. Then he married Kate Adams from Memphis, Tennessee. He and Kate had three children. Helen was their first. Kate's family descended from two presidents, John Adams and John Quincy Adams. Her father was a brigadier general. She was a Memphis belle, very well read, very educated. When they married, Captain Keller had their bedroom uh, set up in the little cottage that's right <coughs> next door. Uh, his mother was still living in the mas here in the home and was in the master bedroom. So uh, when you go out there and look in the little cottage, you're going to see where they slept, but also where Helen was born, June the 27th of 1880. She was a healthy, normal child up until 19 months. She ran a very high fever, and that's what left her deaf and blind. More modern doctors said she probably had scarlet fever, or maybe it could have been meningitis, but they would call it brain fever in that time period. Helen's family was heartbroken. They would go to any doctor they learned about. There wasn't anything anyone could do. In the following years, Helen, who was highly intelligent, became more and more frustrated and her behavior showed that frustration. Helen could be uh, quite unruly and difficult to deal with at times. When her sister Mildred was born, Helen was six years old. Helen was so jealous of the new baby, she walked in one day and realized the baby was in the cradle and flipped the cradle over. Mm. Well, that certainly alarmed the family and they said, we have got to find help for Helen. They went to an eye specialist in Baltimore, Maryland. He could not help. He said, take Helen to see Alexander Graham Bell. The man who invented the very first telephone was a teacher of the deaf. He was from Canada. He was often in Washington, D.C. And Helen met him in Washington when she was six years old and they were lifelong friends. But he's the one that told the family, Helen doesn't need a doctor, she needs a teacher and he suggested that they should write a letter to Perkins School for the Blind. That school is near Boston. It's in Watertown, Massachusetts. He said, perhaps someone from Perkins would even come to your home in Tuscumbia, Alabama. So they came home and wrote the letter. This is the teacher that came. That's Annie Sullivan, 20 years old. Annie had a really difficult, uh, sad background. Her family were poor Irish immigrant potato farmers. Her mother died young of tuberculosis. She and her little crippled brother, Jimmy, were abandoned. They were taken to a poorhouse and left. The little brother didn't live very long, about three months. Annie was going blind. Annie had had eye infections her whole young life, uh, no money for medicine, it was ignored. The poorhouse was very unsanitary, and what she had was trachoma, which is caused by bacteria. Annie did not even go to school until she was 14 years old. She got up the nerve to beg some visitors to let her get out of the poorhouse. She said, I want to learn to read. And by that time, she had lost so much of her sight, it had to be Perkins, the blind school. She was behind and out of place, but she ended up being the valedictorian of her class. And they did surgeries on her eyes, which helped. She was still what we might call legally blind when she came here. 
She had graduated. Uh, she was uh, helping with the younger children, uh, not sure what she would do to make a living in her life. The letter came from the Kellers asking for help. $25 a month plus room and board to come and be a teacher to this blind and deaf six-year-old little girl in Tuscumbia, Alabama. That was a lot of money in that time period. Annie got on the train and came here. She met Helen March the 3rd of 1887. In a moment, you'll go upstairs and look at two bedrooms. The boys were using the bedroom on the top right, but on the left, there's a bedroom that Helen and Annie shared. The little bed was Helen's. The bigger bed is where Annie slept. Helen was so mischievous, shortly after Annie arrived, Helen noticed the key had been left in the door of the bedroom and thought what a great trick this would be to play on this person that has moved into my life. Helen wrote in her own book that she turned the key, pulled it out, and hid it under a big piece of furniture. And then she just went about her day. The family realized the teacher was locked up, but nobody could find the key. And they finally had to bring a tall ladder from the barn, and Annie had to climb out the steep second-story window to get out of the house. Good way to start a career, right? Funny stuff. <laughs> From day one, any object that Helen touched, Annie would name, but she was spelling into her hand the manual alphabet. Helen caught on to that just immediately and started copying it. Annie would spell something, Helen would spell it back. Helen thought they were playing a finger game. It didn't mean anything until they got to the pump that's still in the backyard. That was just one month and two days after Annie came. The water was flowing over Helen's hands. Annie was spelling W-A-T-E-R over and over. And Helen later wrote that when she felt the cool, wet something that was flowing over her hands, it brought back a misty memory of Wawa, what she had called water at 19 months. And that made her realize that all of the spelling they were doing, they were actually naming things. So if everything had a name, she had a way to talk with her hands. Helen wanted to know what everybody and everything was called. She learned 30 words that first afternoon. And by end of summer, she knew 625 words. She learned how to read Braille and master Braille by age 10. They later realized that Helen was high-level genius. She was quite intelligent. They said her IQ was at least probably 160, so really smart. Helen and Annie learned everything that she could learn. 640 acres was their schoolroom, plus wherever they traveled, wherever they went. Everything had to be learned through smell or touch. And then Annie said, I've taught her all I can at home. She needs to go to school. Back and forth, they would go to Perkins School for the Blind. They went to schools for the deaf in Boston and New York. They went to a girls' school, Cambridge School for Girls in Boston. And then at age 20, Helen decided she wanted a college degree, something no deaf blind in the world had done. Helen was the first to get a degree. She graduated from Radcliffe College, which at that time was the sister school to Harvard. Boys would go to Harvard, girls would go to Radcliffe. Radcliffe didn't even think she should come. They said uh, they did not think a blind and deaf would be able to uh, accomplish anything at their school. But she graduated with honor in four years, so uh, that was quite an achievement. Now, after graduation, Helen did several different things. But the way she became world famous, the American Foundation for the Blind hired her to be a counselor, and she represented that organization. We know of at least 35 countries that Helen visited. She would speak to government officials wherever she was. She would encourage the blind, the deaf, and see what could be done, not what couldn't be done, all over the world. She changed the world's understanding of handicap, and that was her mission. She worked for that organization until she was 80, and she had meant so much to them that they continued to pay her up until her death. But she worked till she was 80. I mean, that was, uh, that was a lot. Helen and her teacher, Annie, and her secretary, Polly Thompson, who also became a companion, uh, they all three spent their lives together, 
Annie was with Helen 50 years. Polly was with Helen 46 <coughs> years. And uh, Helen was actually the last to die of the three ladies. Uh, she died June 1st, 1968. She was 26 days short of her 88th birthday. And uh, when she passed, her funeral service was held in the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. But all three ladies are entombed there. Helen had been offered that opportunity earlier, and she said, if my companions could be there also. So Helen and Annie and Polly are all entombed together in the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Helen wrote 12 books in her life. They were published in many foreign languages. She wrote beautiful poetry. She had essays published in magazines. Helen met all the presidents, beginning with uh, Grover Cleveland, all the way through John F. Kennedy. Always welcome in the White House. So that's, that's pretty much the basis of our little talk here. Excellent. And we'll talk about yeah. the rooms next. Okay. All right.